Bills including a right to work, firearms in courthouses, and protecting the elderly are detailed in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The first full week of session is now complete, and the GOP wasted no time introducing controversial measures. On Monday, the Senate took up the confirmations of four commission posts. Three of them passed without debate. They include Tom Sorrell of Transportation, Tom Landwehr to the DNR, and Ramona Doman to Public Safety. Lengthy debate, however, surfaced when former Senator Ellen Anderson's Public Utilities Commission appointment was taken up. I very much like to confirm former colleagues to administration positions. It is rare when I object to an appointment. But in this case, I cannot support the confirmation of this nominee. Ellen Anderson was a motivated legislator. She served with many of us, and we know her to be extremely passionate with very strong beliefs about how energy resources resources should be developed. Those same passions also manifest itself into a management style that allowed little room for open discussion and compromise. And in the context of the PUC and regulation of all our utility industries, that deeply concerns me. Members, I don't believe we've given former Senator Acting Commissioner Ellen Anderson adequate time to review her performance. I think we owe her that. It seems clear to me that this isn't about a record on the job, this is about something else. I think we would be wise as a state senate to give her some additional time so that we can make a more thorough evaluation of her performance. A recent case in Cook County where a prosecuting attorney was shot in a courthouse brings to light the issue of security. We have with us right now Representative Tony Cornish who has two different bills to enhance security in courtrooms. Thanks so much for joining us, Representative. We appreciate your time. Yeah. Let's talk about your bills first of all. Let's talk about the case first of all. And Tim, Sc Tim Scannell, he is pretty much the face behind your legislation. Talk to us a little bit about his story and his role in this legislation. Um, well, actually, his role was, was minimal to begin with because the legislation started five days before this tragic occurrence up in Cook County. Uh, it was sent to me by a county attorney who said that he didn't know if he would have the support of the County Attorneys Association. In fact, they had voted to stay neutral. Then Tim was shot uh, some five days after I received it. Then the whole mood changed of the County Attorneys Association, rightly so, and they reconvened and uh, went to formal approval. And you did open the door for my next question that you started working on this prior to that shooting. Why do you think it's so important, first of all, to tighten security and how will your bill, which would allow prosecuting attorneys to carry guns in courtrooms, indeed tighten security in your opinion? Well, I'm a little bit of a different egg, as you know, when it comes to security, I believe that more guns make it safer, not less guns. Like some people, I don't want to create one more killing zone. We have a killing zone on our college campuses now where a perpetrator knows that everybody is sheep and they're unarmed. We have another killing zone in daycare and K-12 where they know everybody is unarmed. They can walk in and have their will with anybody they like, and the same way with a, a courthouse. And I actually hope that the, the judges open it up a little bit and let them carry actually into the courtroom, which my bill doesn't address. It's just on duty. But the uh, county attorneys receive real threats. Uh, one um, testified that uh, he had a contract put on his life. They even had sniper uh, situated or about to, they could have been posted, diagrammed out. And they really feel like they need more protection. And you indeed, of course, believe that this would provide that protection. Opponents of the bill say that carrying guns into courtrooms, courthouses, excuse me, isn't necessarily an the answer, but they appreciate the conversation. So what are some other things that perhaps you would support, some other ideas that have been brought forth? Well, naturally, we would support, um, I and uh, my colleagues would, re would support metal detectors and screening, but there's no way we can physically afford it. I mean, there's just no way possible with all the courthouses and the extended courthouses out in the suburbs. I mean, there's hundreds of them. 
And so it, it's, it's not feasible. So in lieu of that, we just want to give them some minimal protection to allow them to defend themselves rather than worry about uh, if a bailout is competent enough and put your hands in somebody else's uh, security umbrella. Why not be able to defend yourself? And that was the impetus behind the bill. And let's talk about the second bill, which would be to enhance penalties for those who shoot or harm a prosecuting attorney, essentially placing them in the same category as a police officer. Why do you think it's necessary to, to move forward with this? Well, we, what we've discovered, and I really didn't know this, even with 36 years of law enforcement, that prosecutors receive real threats and assaults, well evidenced naturally by Tim's case in Cook County. But peace officers and correctional officers are the only ones that are afforded this enhanced penalty of first degree murder right now. So it's just a simple two word addition where I think it, one or two where it hits, says prosecutors are in the mix with peace officers and correctional officers, affording them the same enhanced penalty if they're uh, assaulted. And you've already had a hearing on your bills, and in that particular hearing, there weren't a whole lot of questions, but there were concerns from county attorneys and others as well that the, those concerns with, were with carrying firearms into courtrooms. And you said that sh this should not be a concern because that's not a part of your legislation, but sometimes somebody might forget that they have a gun on them or, you know, examples like this. So, so how would you, it, short of not having metal detectors at those doors, how important is it to you that they be responsible for the firearms they carry if this is indeed placed into law? Well, I think the same mistakes will be made with or without the law if somebody carries one or somebody's allowed to carry one in. So I think that my uh, proposal is a good one in that it still lets the the judge trump uh, my provision where he can say not in my courtroom you don't. There are, it should be noted, there are numbers of judges that are packing heat under the robes right now are very pro-gun and some that will allow into the courtroom. And they believe like I do that if a person starts shooting in a courtroom this old adage of somebody's going to get caught in the crossfire just doesn't apply. In most cases these people are cowards and they either commit suicide or flee at the first shots it's actually fired at them. So I think it would even in the courtroom it would reduce casualties. What do you think of the chances of this bill being moved through, passed, and eventually signed by the governor? Oh, I think they're very good. Anytime, it's the first one of my gun bills that I've ever had a sheriff's association or the county attorneys sign on. They're usually opposed to them. This one, uh, not surprisingly, they're in favor of. So when you get support like that and then the general public and the, the range delegation with what happened to one of their own, I think it's pretty much greased for success. And the governor? The governor, I haven't talked to him, but um, he's a sort of a gun guy, common sense, as far as I know. I've talked with him before, and he's not anti-gun or one of these people that are afraid of guns and thinks that more guns are going to, you know, more deaths. So I think he'd sign it once it got to him. Okay. Representative Cornish, thanks for coming on and talking about your legislation. We certainly appreciate your time. Thank you very much. My name is Dan the Graff. voter ID constitutional amendment made its first stop in committee on Wednesday. Senator Scott Newman's bill would allow Minnesota voters to decide whether someone needs to show a photo ID at the polls before they can vote. There's two camps here. There's one camp that is all about access, access to the ballot, making it easy to vote. There's another camp here that thinks that the idea of being easy to vote and also hard to cheat aren't mutually exclusive ideas. Uh, this is a smart body. I believe this legislature is capable of handling the enacting of this constitutional amendment in a way that will make it easy to vote, but also hard to cheat. Uh, the objective of the 21st century voter ID bill that was passed last session was to make it easy to vote, but hard to cheat. Right now it's all about, oh, it's got to be easy to vote, easy to vote, easy to vote. Well, what about making sure that people who aren't eligible to vote aren't gaming the system? What about making sure that people aren't voting more than once? aren't bringing people in from out of state to vote in precincts that they don't live in. How do we know that isn't happening? To commit a voter fraud, for example, a Somali American is, you will be deported to Somalia, where it is a very a dangerous, high, highly unlikely. Can you imagine that somebody is going to commit a voting fraud when they know that they will be committing a crime and they will be deported to Somalia, where their life is in danger? So I want to tell this member of this committee to really look at this issue and we have to make sure that we actually encourage people to participate in the election process. And this voting ID requirement, Senate File 1577, is heading the wrong way. I urge this committee to reject S File 157. And thank you very much.
bill that would increase penalties to those who would abuse or neglect vulnerable adults, is a piece of legislation offered up by Senator Warren Limmer. He's here today to talk a little bit about it. Thank you so much for joining oh, glad us. Glad to be here. Senator, let's begin with the fact that Minnesota does have currently an Adult Protection Act. We do. We so, do have a Vulnerable Adult Protection Act, but it, so only, it only goes as far as a gross misdemeanor which is a rather low threshold, a low penalty for what, what could be a very atrocious crime of neglecting, let's say, a, a very frail elderly person, a person with a, a mental disability, uh, intentional neglect, not accidental, not because you have to, some um, healthcare worker is tending another patient under their care, but this would be for those who would intentionally neglect a patient, uh, someone who might be frail or like mental disability, uh, that's who we're going after. So and what's your vision for the bill? Well, I intend to pass it, and I think we have the uh, strength of the legislature uh, recognizing that this is kind of on the rise. And it's on the rise because our population of our elderly people, those with mental disability, baby boomers now coming into the, the older age set, are going to start swamping the system. And with that increase in population, we're going to have more increases in intentional neglect. And we want to get ahead of it. We want to draw a clear line that says, if you intentionally neglect one of these people that we put in your care, we're going, we could charge you up to a felony charge and a 10-year penalty in prison. Okay, well, you just answered my question about what the penalties would be. I do want to ask you the fact that Mickey Rourke, or excuse me, Mickey Rooney recently testified in Washington, D.C. on the issue of elder abuse. He kind of provided a face for this issue, yeah. nationally speaking. Now, statistics are hard to come by. You did say that this problem appears to be growing. Do you think it's growing, or do you think more people are just reporting it? You know, it's, it's kind of hard because quite often there's no reporting. Let's say it's a, a person with a mental deficiency. They're not gonna report it. Uh, perhaps a person who has advanced Alzheimer's, they can't report it. Uh, but if someone finds out that there's a intentional neglect, it's going to be reported and the penalty will be severe. Many times the person who is preying on this vulnerable adult tends to be a family member. Do you find that this could be a very difficult bill to enforce? Uh, it may be. But that doesn't mean that we ignore the problem, and it doesn't mean that we not have strict guidelines and uh, a serious consequence for when that crime has taken place. You know, we know that care of our elderly or those who are frail, oftentimes the family takes that individual in. They love that person. Uh, other times there may be some bad actors in the family that think it's an inconvenience and it may even lead to the point of intentional neglect. If you're going to take the responsibility of, to assume the care and the food uh, and the cleanliness of an individual, that responsibility will have consequences if you intentionally fail not to deliver those services. Senator, it's fair to say that nobody would necessarily um dispute the idea of protecting vulnerable adults, mm -hmm. and yet you are saying that there is some pushback on this legislation. Well, there's pushback from uh, the institutions, the care providers. They don't want to get caught in the unintended consequence, and so they're a little nervous about it. This bill's been floating around for a good seven to 10 years, and I started it way back, about seven, eight years ago. The point is then, as it is now, if we intentionally neglect an animal, a farm animal, that perpetrator could get a felony charge. But in Minnesota, if it's a human being under our care, it's simply a gross misdemeanor. There's something wrong with our priorities by having laws on the book that don't protect our frail human beings less than what we do with common farm animals. Okay, Senator, and of course we'll track that legislation that comes up in committee this week. I do want to shift topics real quickly. Right. Senator John Marty is one of a couple of senators who have crafted legislation that would repeal the constitutional amendment defining marriage as a union between a man and a woman. Now, in your opinion, does his and the other legislation have any teeth to it? Well, the teeth comes from the, uh, the uh, majorities in both bodies. Is there enough people to vote for that and reverse the decision we just made 
eight, nine months ago, of allowing the public to vote on a critical issue uh, through a constitutional amendment. Constitutional amendments are allowed uh, by the Constitution, and we decided that the issue of def defining marriage, which has already been challenged in the court, it's resting with the appellate court now, uh, whether or not we should accept the current one man, one woman standard in Minnesota. We in the legislature thought, the majority of the legislators thought, that this was such an important issue that rather allow the court to decide this definition, we should give it to the public. We give them a year and a half to discuss it, to promote it, to uh, debate it, and then we'll have our vote in November. I don't think there's a, I, I find it very difficult to find a single issue that I would not trust the public with. Apparently Senator Marty doesn't believe that. I think uh, the legislature spoke clearly. It reflected the wishes of our constituents last year uh, that they wanted to define this. Their values, not the little group of legislators here or even less, a few a few judges on an appellate court or a Supreme Court. I think it's a wise decision to give this decision to the public. I'm not sure if Senator Marty really has uh, a majority of votes in both chambers to reverse this. Um, proof's in the pudding, you know, but uh, we'll see. Did you expect legislation like this to come up? You know, I really didn't. I thought that the issue would have been kind of done with. We had a lot of protest. We had a lot of discussion. The idea has been discussed in Minnesota for at least seven, eight years. So uh, it, it has been extremely well vetted in the legislature. Apparently, some people just don't want to let, it, let the public vote. And uh, that's kind of sad, in my opinion. OK, Senator Limmer, we certainly appreciate your time. And we'll track, as I said earlier, your legislation. So yeah. have a great day. And again, thanks Thank for you. joining us. The House debated for roughly six hours on a number of bills that are designed to reform litigation legislation. Four tort reform bills generated considerable discussion and disagreement. Each bill addresses different areas of tort reform the GOP says is important to make Minnesota more competitive and balanced for businesses in the state. Let's get back to what the core of this statute is about. It's about maintaining the actual claim of, of plaintiff or defendant in these cases at the value at which that claim is first made so that it doesn't lose value uh, in real dollars during the pendency of the claim. Also, let's not lose sight that these, this is about prejudgment interest. Uh, we talk about bad actors here, and we're all sympathetic to those situations, but until that judgment is actually uh, adjudicated and entered, there is no fault uh, legally. And in fact, this interest, again, is just in order to uh, maintain the value of the claim. So you just said that you're exempting out businesses that make claims. They still get the 10%? Uh, when they go after their insurance companies, they get 10 percent, but members of the military and elderly folks and disabled people and victims of fraud who are intentionally defrauded, you'd, you'd reduce them to 4 percent. Mr. Speaker, Representative Atkins, no. These are situations in which the insurance company is the uh, judgment uh, creditor, and uh, that, in those situations, on a breach of insurance contract case, insurance companies need to pay the 10 percent, not as the claimant, but as the judgment creditor. There is no way that I would ever vote for something like that. Uh, that is campaign flyer stuff by my opponent. That is the absolute craziest thing I have ever heard, Representative Maserol. So you're going to single out businesses that make claims under commercial and professional policies. I just looked it up here. They get 10 percent, but victims of intentional fraud and the elderly and disabled and veterans, they get 4 percent. That is absolutely obscene. Senator John Marty is here now to talk a little bit about his attempt to repeal the constitutional amendment that would define marriage as a union between one man and one woman. Senator, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. First, let's talk about your legislation and how much traction do you think it can get? Well, I think there are a whole lot of legislators, I actually think of both parties, who 
think what happened last year was a mistake in putting a constitutional amendment on the ballot to limit rights for other people. This would be the first time we put a constitutional amendment on our state constitution that takes away rather than guarantees rights for people. And um, I don't know if it's going to get traction or not. Uh, obviously, the majority passed the constitutional amendment last year. Um, we would need both houses to pass it. We partly want to make the point that, you know, you have a chance to undo a mistake before before it goes further. We'd love to give the the majority a chance to reconsider. So you had just stated you're doing this kind of to make a point, and and you'll see if there's some traction that is gained right. from it. So if how do you not, get the if, message if out it, there? If not, if the bill does not move forward, then the Constitution will be on the ballot this November. There's already both sides are gearing up. It's going to be many could be tens of millions of dollars spent on this thing. And I don't think that's in the interest of the public to spend all our time talking about that. We should talk about the bigger issues affecting the state. I've said all along, I don't think state government should be picking sides between various religious beliefs. I'm a Lutheran, Christian. My belief is that the God I believe in thinks that people should make lifelong commitments to each other. They should be able to choose their partner. You know, others who say they have the same religious belief come up with different conclusions, but government should not be discriminating in writing to laws certain religious beliefs over others, and therefore the constitutional guarantees ought to be to everybody. Senator Limmer states that he believes this should go to the voters and let the voters decide, and he has confidence in Minnesota voters to decide what they think is right. So why not? I don't think human rights should ever be up for somebody else's vote. I mean. Forty years ago, you put voting rights for interracial marriages, overwhelmingly rejected. Lots of states constitutionally prohibited that. It took the U.S. Supreme Court to say that it's unfair discrimination. Forty years later, the opponents of that have come around to see, you know, that's not fair. That's not right. But, you know, we had constitutions banning people from opposite races, different races from marrying each other. Um, I think if Minnesota were to pass this constitutional amendment, we would be the last state to do so. And I will guarantee you that 10 years from now, it'll be the same thing as happened the only time the federal government had an amendment to its constitution taking away people's rights prohibition. 13 years later, it was repealed. This one will be repealed too, but I just don't think Minnesota wants to be known as one that's taking away the rights of its own people. All right, Senator, we're going to shift gears to Representative Cornish's legislation, which would essentially allow prosecutors to carry a gun in a courthouse, and it would also enhance penalties for those who do harm a prosecuting attorney, bringing it up to the same level as, say, if you harm a police officer. What do you think of his legislation? Well, first of all, the second portion of it, increasing the penalties, yeah, prosecutors are vulnerable in the same way law enforcement people are, they're seen in theory, I guess it is, that, that the person they're prosecuting doesn't want them to be prosecuted just like they don't like the police to catch them and so on. And they may be at higher risk and therefore enhance penalties because it relates to their job. I think that's appropriate. Um, and I don't expect that there'd be a lot of, I think a lot of people see it similar, their role is similar to law enforcement person in terms of the risk. So I think that would be something that's likely to be supported by people across the board. The idea, the second portion of it, that they should be able to carry guns, first of all, I don't think that's going to change anything in the courtroom because I think the judges are going to say no. And I think it's not going to change anything in the courtroom. It may change it somewhere else in the courthouse setting. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the idea that more people carrying more guns is going to make our communities more safe. Um, to me, you know, maybe it is, maybe it is something that's appropriate. Um, again, I think it's misrepresented if it's suggesting they're going to be carrying guns in the courtrooms because I think the judges aren't going to say that's okay. What do you think of the bigger picture security with courthouses and courtrooms? What would you suggest to tighten it if you even think that it needs to be tightened? Well, I think we should certainly be looking at it. Same thing at the state capitol here. I mean, you go down to any big bank or office building downtown, Minneapolis or St. Paul, any of the office buildings, you have security there. You have to sign in, you have to get a badge, you have to have somebody come and meet you, all that sort of thing. Here in the state capitol, we want to have much more open, but there are no metal detectors here, unlike the Hennepin and Ramsey County courthouses. No metal detectors, nothing of that sort. Um, just open access in effect. And I think that, you know, it's not good to just wait until something tragic happens, like happened or happened up in Lake County. I don't think we want to wait for things to happen, and I think reviewing the security at courthouses and reviewing the security at, like, state capitol, 
uh, I think that's very important that we do that. And it's a touchy issue to talk about because it can be very expensive to deal with this security. But on the other hand, it's a, it's a tough issue to balance. But I think we have to take a second look at courthouses in the state capitol. And so do you think Representative Cornish's legislation, if nothing else, opens up this conversation a bit? That's very important. The more we can talk about these things, um, the better off it is. But um, I think, you know, it's an ugly situation we're in right now where you have uh, potentially violent people doing things to prosecutors, to public officials across the board. Um, I don't think we should live our lives in fear of it, but on the other hand, it is an issue that deserves discussion, and I'm glad it is being discussed. Okay, Senator, we have time for one last question, and I want to touch on Senator Limmer's bill, which would enhance the penalties of neglecting or abusing vulnerable adults, bringing it up to par with perhaps a felony, depending on the level the of abuse. Or you, there, exactly. Yeah. Now, there are some concerns by providers that it goes a bit too far. What are your thoughts? I haven't heard all the concerns of the providers yet, but I think it is appropriate. I mean, you have to realize when you've got somebody who may not, very vulnerable older adult, um, usually older adult, or a person with a severe disability who cannot retaliate, cannot respond, cannot fight back, cannot notify somebody else if their caregiver is abusing them. Um, and every now and then you hear a story in a nursing home or something of just horrendous abuse. Um, yes, I think it does deserve very serious penalties. I think it's important to hear what the providers are saying just to make sure it's being done in a fair way that doesn't um, mess up the way things work. But, but number one, our, our concern has to be for the most vulnerable people and, and seniors, people with severe disabilities who cannot fight back, cannot even alert others to the problem, in many cases are extremely vulnerable. So I think it's worth, it's worth doing something with. Senator Marty, thanks for your thoughts on all of these issues. We certainly appreciate your time. My pleasure. This group of lawmakers proposed legislation that would, essentially, allow Minnesota workers to opt out of being in a union. They call it a right to work bill. Union reps call it a right to work for less bill. Representative Steve Draskowski disputes that claim. The numbers they use basically compare the, uh, uh, the long-standing numbers or the, the current numbers of uh, right to work states that many of them uh, were lower wages to begin with. And, we, and many of the, uh, the uh, forced unionization states were higher wages to begin with. But what we see here, Pat, is growth in wages is much higher in right-to-work states than in non-right-to-work states. And that's what we're talking about. The so-called right-to-work constitutional amendment is nothing more than the right to work for less. It will cut wages, it will cut benefits. It's the, it's the type of uh, Republican rhetoric that will take benefits and jobs away from middle class people and make their rich friends richer. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. That concludes this week's program from all of us at Senate Media and House Public Information Services. I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.